Welcome to our first Top Car Special covering the various rounds of the South African Rally Championship. And not only will we be looking at the thrills and spills and blow by blow action, we'll also be taking a look at some of the background stories. The Cape Town based Toyota Dealer Rally is the third round of the South African National Rally Championship. The two day event attracted top crews from around the country, all hoping for success while contesting the 15 punishing special stages spanning some 200 kilometers of flat out rallying. It promised to be a true test of man and machine. And here with me to provide expert analysis and interpretation of the event is one of the legends of South African motorsport, Cyril van der Merwe. Few South African motorsport personalities are as famous as Super Cyril van der Merwe. The multiple Springbok and ex-South African rally champion has competed locally and abroad with great success. He last actively rallied here behind the wheel of a works day with Lanos. Who then has Cyril put his money on for the event? Sorrow, let's look forward to this event now. Are your expectations? To me, really, I think it's going to be a, a surge. I'll be Enzo Dice up front. With Gibble maybe upsetting the apple cart every now and again. But uh, if I was a betting man, I would say uh, I'd put my money on Damsu for this rally. He's always been very hard to beat in the Cape. I think he's very determined. You know, he's lost points in the last event. So, uh, yes, I'd give it to him. New to the rally scene this year are the Group N4 near standard production models featuring turbo engines and all wheel drive. The Subaru Impreza Turbo is piloted by Johnny Gemmel. Johnny, you're probably the final of the season with your results up to now and your stage times. How do you feel about this event? No, we're looking forward to this event. Um, we've done two events now with this car. And you're running up amongst the leaders, mixing yeah, with them. Hopefully, we can do it some more this weekend and we'll give them a hard time. Biggest competition is going to come from where? Um, the first, I think, uh, Yanni Habig, Serge Damso, uh, Enzo Kun, and myself should be there somewhere. Another example of the super fast N4 category is the high tech Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 6 of Fernando Raider and navigator Nick Haddon. With two rollovers in the first two rallies to his credit, Raider hasn't enjoyed much in the way of good fortune so far, though. Fernando, if you were a cricketer, they'd say you have a perfect pair. Two rolls, two events. Yeah, so there's not much I can say. You're right. Uh, the first one I saw coming, this one I never even saw coming. You know, it's, there's a bunk there where it should have been. Did you have any major damage to the car? No, it was just all cosmetic stuff. Wings, windscreen, bonnet. No, luckily the cars are strong, so it wasn't a problem at all. You should be one of the front runners. You plan to be up front there? And yeah, I think we're going to do it differently this time. We want to go from the word go. We'll just give it everything and see what happens. No time to worry about anything else and concentrate on finishing events. Let's try and win it. Rueda is hoping for better luck in the Cape and has even changed the number of the car. No more 69. What's the story there? No, sorry, I've, I've never had it before. The first time I had it, we went on our roof. The second time we had it on, on our roof. So. You are talking about a car number now. Not no, no, I got that. Out. That's why people say, you know, you read it both ways. Okay. So no more. As you can see, 65, only one way up. The N4s will have to pull out all the stops to take on the premium category Class A8 rally cars. These are highly modified 2-litre two-wheel drive speed machines and are campaigned by the factory teams and top drivers, such as reigning South African rally champ Serge Damso. You're winning a non-finish. Bit of pressure on you now. It's definitely uh, more pressure at the moment. You know, it means I've got to win a few more to try and catch up at the moment. But uh, rallying, anything can happen, so we just have to hang in there. You've uh, obviously tested the car since the last engine failure. What does it feel like? The car is definitely a lot better from the last event. We did a lot of testing and uh, I feel more confident with the car, definitely. Those in the rally know are pretty convinced that Damso's main protagonist will be Sassel Volkswagen Works pilot Gani Habich. Also an ex-South African rally champ, Habich already has one win in the kitty for the year and will be chasing a second in his A8 Volkswagen Golf. You're on Sergio's home ground. We've talked about that many hours. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, I think psychologically uh, he's got the pressure to do well. And uh, maybe we can turn that to our advantage. The enforcers are starting to do well. well. How big a threat are they at this point in time? I think if we have rain and the vent's slippery, 
we're definitely going to have a problem and uh, I think we must never underestimate the four-wheel drive turbocharged cars. Ironically, some of Harburg's toughest opposition could come from within his own team's ranks. Enzo kuhn has been on the bench for a few years, but now returns as Harburg's teammate in a second class A8 Sassel Volkswagen Golf. Considered one of South African rallying's brightest stars, Kuhn is relishing the chance to get back into the thick of things. The A8 cars versus the N4s on a fast rally like this, where do you see them being? Yes, they have a distinct advantage here, you know, the, the N4 car is very stable being a four-wheel drive car with turbo and it's got good pulling power and talking in top gear, so I think there'll be a problem. Two events, two bad results. We had a bit of Akinen's luck this year. We started this year thinking that we'll have an advantage over other teams because this car had been used overseas and it's a tried and tested formula. But um, I, I must be honest, we've done a lot of changes to the car and, and the setup. So I haven't settled down in the car and I'm, I'm looking forward to this event to really get into the car. The action on day one began at the Kalani Racing Circuit near Mulnerton, where the track hosted a highly popular super special stage. Unlike conventional rally special stages, a super special pits two cars against each other on mirror images of the same stage route. It's a trend that started in the World Rally Championship abroad and is now a crowd favourite here. So well, let's look at the concept of a super stage. It seems to go down rather well with the spectators. I think it is a, spect a spectacle. You see direct competitors competing for the same piece of road. And uh, what have you got? Probably three and a half, four thousand people here to watch this lot. I think it's very exciting from that point of view. People like it and maybe they should do this every small town they go to. You know, this type of thing, we don't see that often. Cars of this quality dicing each other in a straight line or that type of thing. So, uh, yes, I think it's great stuff. It's easy to understand just why the crowds love the super stage action. Most of the dices were closely run affairs and at Kilani the super special was repeated, providing spectators with double action value. Overall, though, the A8 cars were holding their own against the N4s, with Damso leading the pack. Let's take a look at the results. The action now moved into three night stages, which would sort out the men from the boys. With his home advantage, Damso was expected to push hard, but lost time instead, suggesting some or other mechanical malady. The work Sassol Golfs of Habich and Kuhn, on the other hand, were going great guns. The expected duel between the N4 turbo cars of Gemmel and Rieder and the front runners, however, was fast running out of steam. Clearly, both drivers could not match the pace of their more experienced rivals up front on stages that would have required courage in daylight, let alone at night. Gemmel, trailing the leaders by only seven seconds after the super specials, lost a full one minute 39 seconds after dark. Rueda in the Mitsubishi was also struggling. Radiator problems saw him lose more than three minutes. We ended up with uh, expecting Serge to be leading, but we have instead we have, I think, a week six uh, or nine seconds ahead of Enzo. Enzo in turn 14 seconds ahead of Serge. So I think it's going to be a lot of a dice today. There is some talk that Serge might be having problems, but nobody's saying anything. What's leading you to think that there is something wrong with Serge's car at the moment? The fact that, uh, like I said, Spes Bono stage, he's never been beaten there last night. Uh, Abik took 15 seconds, seconds off him, Enzo was ahead of him, he was really nowhere, so, uh, you know, it's just not the normal search on that stage. And we haven't had the time from this morning, but if it continues, then obviously there's something wrong with the car. After looking at the leading results at the end of day one, the question is, can Surge fight back? And will the N4 cars put up a real fight? Day two dawned with a revitalized Damso proving his detractors wrong by clawing back 18 seconds on the first stage of the morning. Harbich, still in the lead, now realized that the fight was on. The same could not be said of the N4s though, which were even being upstaged by some of the A6 and A7 cars. What is interesting though, Mike, is that uh, the A7 car of Fekken and uh, JP Damso and A6 actually headed the N4s. 
And we wouldn't have expected that. Sure, but it's still, a, it's still a long day ahead of us. It's still a long day ahead of us, although they lost quite a bit of time to the, to the A8s, the n They're over a minute behind them now, and to make up a minute isn't, uh, isn't that easy. What was Enzo Kuhn's take on the lack of pace in N4? What happened to the N4s? Didn't you expect a bit of bit more of a challenge from them? Right? We did, but these are real uh, stages where you need commitment. You know, You've, they are flat out uh, stuff into fast corners. And I, I think the experience of the drivers in those cars are counting against them at the moment. It's, it's fast stuff and you, you need to really um, decide on a gear and stick to it and, and make things work. Indeed, Fekin was certainly shoveling the A7 polo players' coals, proving again that he is one of South Africa's brightest young rally stars. I think you're involved in a hell of a battle for third place. Three by, three by dice, really. Yeah, um, JP's about 13 seconds behind us, and Gimmel is three or four seconds behind him, so we, we're having a big dice. Um, stages are very quick, but we're enjoying it. But a big damper was about to be put on the young Fekin's fiery performance as a deep water splash saw the polo player splatter to a halt. He managed to get it going, but the incident demoted him to fifth place. Water splash. Bad day there. Today. Yeah, I know. It's the second time it's happened today. Um, we took a chance. We thought we'd just go for it and see if it happens twice on one day, and it did. While Fekin got away with it, Team Total's Craig Trot was not so lucky, despite a much more careful approach to the water splash. Much to the mirth of the spectators, he had to be pushed out of his predicament. <laughs> Bit deep. Of course, the air intake is at bumper level, so it looks like the engine has swallowed a couple of gallons of water. And without a plug spanner, Trot's challenge ground to a halt. You learn every day in this game. After 20 years, we still pay school fees. The so all behind us here, we're seeing some guys come through very quickly, some very slowly, some are getting stuck. What's the technique on this particular spot? In deep water, there's only two ways. Either you've got to go through flat, like we have saw Enzo and a few others do, but then you also need a good run into it, or very, very slow. It doesn't help, like you saw a few guys speed up in the river. They, then you build up a wave in front of you, and that normally ends up in, in, inside the engine. So it's either going to be flat out or very slow. As a driver approaching something like this, do you think about giving the fans a bit of a show or are you just worried about getting through in a proper way? No, personally, I was very boring through deep water. I always took the very easy option and never, I never went through fast. Because, you know, you lose a few seconds, but you could lose a rally. And some crews certainly lost out. Looking at the water splash here, we've seen five cars by our count being taken out here, and this is obviously an artificially created obstacle. Um, is that in the spirit of the event? You know, they had this type of thing in the Castle Rally for years and years, but they also made a lake, man-made lake, and on the last day, last stage, and it, drivers were always petrified of that last stage because you could actually lose the event. And like you said, we've lost probably five or six cars today. And there's another one in the background. And it's expensive, you know. Okay. The argument is that water is part of rallying, which is true, but lakes aren't. So maybe it was just a bit too deep, you know, the idea basically isn't that bad, but I think when you get to the extremes as we have here now, it's maybe a bit rough on the, on the guys. Gemmel, making up time after the night's disappointment, tackled the water flawlessly. But that man, Reda, and his spectacular Mitsubishi, although smooth through the water, was heading for retirement yet again. At least this time it was with all four wheels still firmly rooted to the road. I don't know what happened this time. Um, we, we've, oh, the engine overheated. All the, all the fins of the radiator shredded and made a hole in the radiator. It happened to us at stage four. We put a new radiator in and it's happened to us right now. At least it wasn't a roll. Yes, you're right. We were a long way from rolling. your mistake? No, no. Certainly not. Thank you. Just talking to Fernando about rolling, you've obviously rolled a few times in your career. More than I could remember, yeah. How scary is it for a driver? You know, at the point just before you roll, you don't actually know you're going to roll. You know that things have gone wrong and you may be out of control. But I don't think you actually get scared until afterwards because it you know, normally happens at speed and it normally is so unexpected that... Uh, he doesn't come into it. I think a driver fights the car till the last second and uh, it's all over then next few seconds you don't know much about. 
It's actually not as dangerous as it usually looks, is it? I mean, you're strapped in and the cars are built for this. It would depend where you roll, of course. You know, coming off a mountain pass could be quite scary. And, uh, of course, rallying, you've got unknown terrain all the time, so uh, you don't really know where you're going to roll until you start rolling. Action is what attracts spectators to a rally, and that's the reasoning behind the water splash at the spectator point, explains Clark of the course, Robert Mull. That's where I think you're going to find most of the spectators. That stage being 8 and 12, they do twice, so the spectators go there, they can really enjoy it, and they'll wait a while and they'll come back. It saves them traipsing all over the countryside. But bringing the sport to the people can have a downside too. As the numbers of spectators attracted by the sport grow, the concern for safety increases as well. The safety of spectators today, it's one of the major problems we have. They don't stand back, they stand on the wrong side. And as Carlos Saint said in about two events ago in the World Championship, he said, I lost three, four seconds because I had to hold back because I couldn't see the road until the spectators stood back. It's slowly growing that way here in Cape Town with, on certain places. That's why spectator points are restricted. At the start of stage seven, Harbif was still ahead of Damso and the scene seemed set for a battle royal. But the tussle between these two arch rivals recently spilled over into the media too. Let's just go back to this issue of uh, Serge versus Yanni. There was an interview where and what was actually said. The question was, is Serge going to be your biggest competition for the year? And Harbif said, well, Serge falls off the road under pressure. So, uh, you know, I think he took exception to that. Serge did take exception and didn't mince his words. Well, I think in the future maybe I should compare myself with uh, Yanni Abek. Maybe I'll have to get Mr. Van der Maeve and then we can have some discussions. Unfortunately, Lady Luck was not smiling on Serge in Cape Town. Watch the right front wheel as the Toyota reaches the last yump and you'll see the front suspension collapse. For Damso, it was all over. It looks like the bottom pin holds the control arm broke off, and uh, it's a pity because we were going so well. And uh, I'm sure we could have caught it in the Volkswagen today. Understandably, the mood in the Toyota camp was black. Question is, what will the impact be on the team's championship chances? We spoke to Navigator Hodgson. Guy, you and Serge were on the comeback trail this morning. Yes. We had a blistering stage and then it all came to naught. Nothing we could do. Retired on the spot. Very unfortunate. It's a bit of a blow for the championship. Two rallies in a row, unfortunately. So it does, that's very bad news for us, yes. This morning, Serge was really, really trying very, very hard and his times showed it. But I think he's obviously been trying a bit too hard once again. So, um, yeah, things look fairly under control for now. One thing's for sure, Serge and Guy won't be taking the setback lying down. We shall win every rally from here on in. With Serge gone, the Volkswagen teammates were free to battle it out for top honours. Or were they? What will the two VW drivers do now? They'll presumably tap off quite a bit? I don't think so. They'll probably carry on at the pace they are at. There's not a hell of a lot between the two of them. And uh, it'll need an effort from the team manager to slow them down at some stage. Which I expect. If there's a definite pattern of one is leading the other one by half a minute or whatever, I expect team orders to issued to say just old stations. What was VW team manager Johan Iwitz's point of view though? Yeah, very, very nice overnight position for your team and we've just heard that uh, Serge has fallen out. Well you obviously have uh, better news information than I have. Your email works better today. Which brings me to the next question. At some stage are you going to implement team orders? It is milling through my mind, but at the moment there will be no team orders. With Serge being out at the moment, uh, I also can't afford that the guys start chasing one another for positions. So I'll leave it up to them for the time being to decide and um, just monitor the situation. But I don't really believe that I should introduce team orders today. If it was later in the championship, it would have been a different situation. Team orders will dictate that one team member is favoured over another to prevent inter-team rivalry and protect the interests of the team and the leading team member. That doesn't make it easier to accept by the drivers, though. The um, pre-season discussions pointed towards a 
uh, the second half of the season where they'll start pulling the strings, so you never know, eh? While Enzo was reveling in the thrill of being back in the thick of things, the expected tussle with the N4 turbo cars simply didn't materialize. With Reda retired, it was left to Gemmel and Trollope in the Subaru to keep up the charge, although there was little chance of catching the front runners. Still, third place was just reward for a stalwart drive. Johnny, you're in a nice safe third place now. Uh, did you battle a bit last night in the dust? Yeah, we, got, uh, we lost about 40 seconds last night on stage four. And, you know, we've been trying to catch up today. This morning we did catch up on the second and third stage, and now comfortable third position I think will hold our stations there. With three yeah. stages to go have you gone into safety mode? Yeah I think so. You know, we don't want to do anything stupid now. You know we've got a lead over the fourth position about over a minute so we'll just take it easy from now. Meanwhile consistently quick stage times push team total star Etienne Lawrence into fourth place in his A6 Toyota Corolla. And after their costly splashdown earlier, Fekin and Levkovitz put on a tremendous display of swift rallying to move back up into fifth. With the top positions now all but decided, it was a case of keeping things together and making it to the finish. Clearly the A8 cars had outclassed the N4s this time round, but that may not always be the case. Just looking at uh, the N4s, of course we talked a lot about them throughout the event. So one of them finished third. Yes, yeah, Johnny Gamble did drove quite a good, good event, he did well I thought, but uh, for him to actually get into winning form he's going to have to go a lot quicker than he's, than he's been up to now. And uh, I think when we get to the next rally, the Sassel in the forest, I think the, it suits the A8 cars. So uh, I think it's going to be a tough, tough for him to, to actually win there, unless of course it rains or something, then it's, then it's a different kettle of fish. Certainly Gemmel is showing great promise and when conditions allow, has already proven that he has every right to consider himself up there with the very best. For Enzo Kuhn, the first finish of the year brought a sweet second place. Do you think that your long layoff has uh, blunted you a bit? On the one hand, I'm surprised with the pace um, that, that they're running at the moment. And on the other hand, I think, uh, you know, I have obviously gone to sleep a bit, but uh, it's come back to me. And uh, I had some good stages today and we put in some, some flyers there. So I think it's, it comes back to you quickly. Making it two wins in a row for Volkswagen was Habich after dominating much of the event. An Italian ace now has to be considered the favourite for the 2001 title. It started off at a hectic pace this morning and uh, I was wondering how long it would last. So, so um, I think, you know, we were very fortunate that we didn't have any major mechanical problems or made any big mistakes uh, in the stages. For now, the sparkle belongs to the Sassel Volkswagen outfit. But can Toyota fight back? We'll have to wait for the fourth round of the South African Rally Championship, the Mpumalanga-based Sassel Rally in June, to find out.